So excited for my next guest, Darius Dale, founder of 42 Macro. Darius, welcome to Forward Guidance. What's up, man? It's good to see you. It's great. How you been, Jack? <laughs> Yeah, I've been good. I hope you've had a well-deserved rest of uh, holiday break. Really uh, excited, really glad you're here, Darius, because a lot of confounding action in the equity market. You know, I believe uh, we're recording on uh, Tuesday, December 28th. I think we're at all-time highs in S&P 500. But if you're an investor in individual stocks, you would never know it because there's been a huge amount of dispersion, uh, a word that I probably wouldn't know if it, if it weren't for you. Uh, so I want to uh, get into it. Explain why is it that sort of SPACs are, are really, you know, looks like a, a dog's breakfast. And then the Apple, the fangs are looking extraordinarily strong. Um, but before we sort of get into all of that, could you just quickly walk uh, viewers through your framework at, at 42 Macro, which is very, uh, it's very quantitative and it has models that depend a lot on the business cycle. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in terms of how we track the business cycle, because ultimately we're using that analysis to help investors, you know, proactively position for changes in the business cycle. Um, you know, we use what we call our, our grid framework. Uh, grid is short for Goldilocks, reflation, inflation, and deflation. Um, and the two variables that determine what grid regime that you're in um, are the change in growth, the impulse in growth, and the impulse in inflation. Notice I said the impulse, the change, the rate of change, not the level of growth or the level of inflation. That is irrelevant information, generally speaking, to the market in terms of our back testing process, um, at least what our back testing process would conclude, and not just ours. Most most professional investors would have concluded that by now. And so when you talk about where a situation where growth's accelerating, you know, and inflation is decelerating, that tends to have a very favorable outcome in, in asset markets. Um, that's a risk on state with a disinflationary bias. So you tend to see things like equities and credit lead uh, to the upside, even though commodities are you know participating, but they generally uh, lag, um, you know, kind of those types of returns. Um, obviously, you know, credit risk. You want to be taking credit risk within the fixed income markets as well. When growth and inflation are trending higher simultaneously, that's what our process calls reflation. Um, that's where you tend to have a risk on bias, but it has a more of an inflationary bent. Um, and so that's where you see the outperformance of commodities, both physical and digital, relative to things like equities and credit, which are also still going up in price. But uh, the, ref the, the key characteristic about reflation relative to Goldilocks is you tend to see outright negative returns in fixed income, particularly long duration uh, securities, bonds, uh, things of that nature. So, um, you know, that's those are the kind of the two pro growth, pro risk on regimes, the two uh, uh, growth uh, slowing regimes where risks tend to be off uh, are inflation and deflation. And so inflation is where growth slowing on a trending basis and inflation is still accelerating. Uh, that tends to be risk off with the dis or the inflationary bias. Uh, you tend to have things like crude oil going up, food prices going up. You know, you tend to have, you know, a, a, a civil unrest, you know, in places where that's a problem, um, things of that nature. And then lastly, you have what we call deflation. That's where uh, growth and inflation are trending lower simultaneously. Uh, that tends to be risk off with a disinflationary bias. That's the that's the regime where, uh, you know, kind of the treasury bonds, the U.S. dollar, gold, defensive type securities within the equity market uh, tend to really outperform. They really shine um, on a relative basis to their high beta cyclical counterparts, particularly in the commodity markets, uh, which tend to not do very poor, which tend to do very poorly in that in that regime. Right. And the reflationary Goldilocks sort of stew we've been in since summer of 2020 been very kind to all sorts of uh, risk assets, credit spreads lower, commodity stocks higher, uh, you know, SPACs, all sorts of growth stocks, so, you know, no profit, but, you know, great. No revenue, even better, like very nice. But recently, Darius, we've seen that risk assets have been performing very poorly. And you have, um, you know, a fantastic analysis of uh, something you call a convergence trade, the dispersion between what's doing well and what's doing poorly. You note that over the past month, uh, things like healthcare, things like uh, uh, low beta stocks, consumer staples, Apple, very, quote, safe, very, quote, boring assets doing very well. Likewise, the sort of the riskiest stuff, uh, Netflix, uh, shorted uh, foreign stocks, uh, a SPAC index, uh, Russell 3000 doing very poorly. Yeah. Uh, what does that indicate to you, this huge dispersion between where sort of long, uh, as, as you say, uh, 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 long low beta is doing well and short high beta is also doing yeah. well. To me, that, that's the market transitioning from pricing in the economic state where growth's been accelerating for pretty much, you know, oh, you know, kind of 15, 18 months. I mean, it's been, a, you know, we've been basically in a one way ticket higher on it from a growth perspective all the way through kind of the, the you know, kind of mid summer of this year. And we're now starting to lose a lot of that growth momentum and it's starting to show up in asset markets. Um, you know, so you know, if you think about not only the U.S. economy, but the global economy as well 
had been in basically what we call, you know, that that state of reflation uh, really since going back to, to the, you know, the, the, the late spring, early summer of last year. And again, that the, now the markets are starting to transition to something that's very different. And that's something that's very different is a scenario whereby growth and inflation are slowing simultaneously for an extended period of time for not just the U.S. economy, but also the global economy. And so you think about this from an asset allocation and portfolio construction perspective, the whole world is long reflation, you know, kind of, you know, two year, nearly two full years of betting on reflation. If you didn't bet on reflation for the most of the last two years, you lost money. Not only do you lose money, you materially underperformed if you're a professional money manager, which is almost worse. Um, but now we you know, now we're going to a state where you basically have to do the opposite in order to outperform if you're a professional money manager. And those influences, the, those changes that those types of investors are going to make are going to have a material impact on the, the performance of asset markets um, in terms of the, 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 the experience that retail investors are having as well. So in terms of, in terms of summarizing our views, I would say we expect risk assets to perform positively in absolute terms over the near term, um, you know, kind of into the well into Q1 um, in terms of what our models are signaling. So you're talking about, do we get to 5,000 S&P 500? That's reasonable prob possibility, uh, reasonable probability rather. Do we make new all-time highs and things like Bitcoin and Ethereum? That's a reasonable possibility. I wouldn't necessarily call it a probability, but I would not be uh, shocked to see that. You know, if we see 11, 10, 11 point percentage change in the positive percentage uh, outcome in the S&P 500, you're going to see some, some positive dynamics in, in cryptocurrency as well. From that point, and again, I think it's really important that we start to identify exactly when we would expect this to occur. Again, as in terms of our models, we expect this, this, this transition process to occur in terms of the market no longer rewarding investors for being long high beta securities, high beta stocks, high beta commodities, things of that nature, and starting to reward investors to be for being long low beta securities. Um, we think that process will really begin in earnest in kind of late Q1, early Q2. And what will either make that a very painful process or not as painful process really is the pace of normalization in GDP and growth um, in the U.S. and global economy. And right now, I think the jury is still very much out on that. But right now, consensus expectations are for that process to be very, very measured. And if it's not measured, we're going to have a lot of volatility next year. So this wall of deflation that you see for the next year, not just in the U.S., but pretty much globally, with a few exceptions we can get into uh, can you just uh, briefly go through how that shapes your, your view uh, on, on asset allocation? You know, uh, you, you got out of the commodity trade recently. What sort of things are you looking to replace that with? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, we, that was a very fortuitous pivot. I mean, we, we sold all of our physical commodity exposure back at the beginning of November, um, you know, prior to the big drawdowns, uh, which we sold all of our commodity exposure. We, we held on to a lot of crypto exposure. Um, you know, it's kind of a mistake on our behalf. But the reality is we should have sold it all. Because um, the reality is that's the stuff that, in our opinion, from the perspective of our process, that is at the most at risk from this transition. Not only is it the most at risk from the perspective of investors kind of already being on one side of the boat, but the most at risk from the perspective of those are the high, highest beta exposures. Well, right now, we're in the place in the economic cycle whereby it no longer pays to uh, overweight high beta um, exposures, commodities, high beta cyclicals within the equity market um, on, a, on a trending basis. That doesn't, that doesn't mean you can't have a day where high beta goes up more than low beta or a day where Bitcoin and Ethereum up 3-5%, who knows. And so, sorry, Darius, could you explain what, what beta is for some listeners who don't Absolutely. know? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Let me take a step back. Uh, so what we mean by beta is, uh, you know, so beta is usually correlated to the U.S. equity market. Uh, obviously, S&P is the mainline index there. And something that's high beta tends to have a higher return in both directions whenever the stock market is moving. So if, if a high beta, if, if the S&P is up 1%, a high beta stock would be up 2% on that, that same day. Um, whereas a low beta stock, if the S&P is up 1%, a low beta stock would be up 0.5% on that, that same day. And typically what happens is, you know, or at least not on that same day, rather, my apologies. Uh, what, you know, this is over trailing, you know, to, you know, most often two-year time period horizon in terms of the, in terms of, um, uh, identifying what's high beta versus low beta. But generally speaking, there are certain types of assets that have high beta characteristics no matter where you are in the market cycle, you know, over long periods of time. That's just endemic to the asset class. Obviously, cryptocurrency is a very high beta asset class in general. Commodities in generally are a high beta asset class relative to stocks, relative to credit, certainly relative to uh, to fixed income securities. And so that's what I mean by investors are generally overweight you know, higher beta securities, both commodities and stocks that look like commodities, SPACs, all these types of other things, um, you know, sort of um, blockchain stocks, you know, crypto stocks, 
all this other stuff that they that they are long and that worked for a long period of time that they no longer are likely to outperform and therefore might actually start to suffer some uh, negative absolute performance as a function of investors demanding liquidity in those types of exposures because they need to rotate into something else. You brought up absolute performance. So you, you think that the boring sectors, uh, um, consumer staples, utilities, healthcare, will uh, bonds, long-term bonds, will outperform those risky sectors of the market that you said. But in terms of absolute performance, um, you know, what what's your outlook on the S&P 500? It seems that a lot of uh, Coca-Cola would have to go up a lot in price for it to make up for all the, the, the risk assets that are going down, right? How does that impact the index? Yeah, so like uh, when I say I look for S&P 500, I mean, you can generally infer that most risk assets are going to be positively correlated to S&P 500 to varying degrees. And so my outlook for the S&P 500 is generally my outlook for risk assets, obviously, to varying degrees again. And so I would say, you know, you I think, you know, you mentioned something earlier uh, that I think is important to highlight. Uh, we have a number of, of sort of, of, of tools in our analytical toolkit uh, that help us manage short-term risk. We have a number of tools that help us manage medium-term risk. And then we have a number of tools that help us give us some clarity in, on, on, a, on a longer-term perspective. From a short-term perspective, i.e. the next you know, kind of month or so, a couple of months, it's very positive that those tools are quite constructive. And what I mean by that, um, our dispersion analysis is showing s such a, a, a high level of dispersion between the winners and losers of late. And as you mentioned, the winners are all the low beta type, um, you know, kind of exposures within the equity market that you might actually see some convergence, i.e. catch up in the lower kind of um, the performing co you know, cohorts, you know, the higher beta things that have been sold of late to make room in investor portfolios for those low beta securities. So what you might actually have is just sort of this big catch up trade where breath actually improves and lifts the broader markets higher. You might see that in the commodity markets as well. Um, that's our that's what our short term analysis is indicating, um, all mostly because of that and also as a function of what we call our cross asset correction risk indicator. Um, I don't sport, I'll, I won't bore you with the details of that. Uh, but the key takeaway is that that indicator is a contra indicator. And right now it's in a it's at a level that suggests that investors are, are kind of maximum fearful, you know, that tends to produce positive excess returns on a go forward basis for, you know, risk assets in general. So I'm quite sanguine for the near from a near term perspective. And I think a lot of the reasons I'm quite sanguine, if you want to take this away from the tools and into the fundamentals, I think Omicron is a blessing in disguise. I think I, I don't think I share that. I think I'm not alone in that view. I think over the last month or so, a lot of investors have started to adopt that framework in terms of, hey, this might actually take us closer to herd immunity. And even if, even if we don't achieve herd immunity, we might actually take us closer to a level where we're getting close, you know, quote unquote, back to normal in society, whatever the hell that means at this point. Um, so, you know, I do believe that the markets could respond very positively to that, you know, that, that, that psychological impulse, even if it's not necessarily realized in growth and in inflation terms. Beyond that is the $64,000 question, Jack, you know, in terms of what, what do you think are, you know, so that means, you know, let's say the S&P goes to 5,000 in that framework, which I think is a very reasonable possibility. What does it do from there? Does it go down to 4,080? 4, Does it go to 4,500? Or is it going to 2,500? And to me, I think the, the speed of the transition in growth, i.e., we're normalizing growth at 5.5%, 6% right now. We don't grow 55 and 6% in the U.S. economy. Global growth you know, just north of 4% right now. The global economy tends to grow somewhere around 1, 1 1.5%. And so we all have to normalize from a growth and inflation perspective. The real question is, how fast does that normal, normalization process occur? Right now, I don't know that anybody can can really have a legitimate answer on that. We have models that are designed to, uh, to 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 project that, but the reality is, I don't think those models are you know have a hope in hell of being particularly accurate, just given all the kind of funky dynamics we have in the economy. You know, you have this massive outsized uh, sort of excess spending in consumer goods. You have this massive gap in consumer services, and in terms of how we net that out from a from a uh, return to trend perspective, you know, that's a negative. $164 billion delta um, from a growth perspective. But then you also have all this excess savings on consumer balance sheets, right around $3.7 trillion. But you have excess budget deficits, right around um, two, or sorry, $2.6 trillion in excess savings, $2.3 trillion in excess budget deficits. So that nets out to a positive $300 billion. You know, so is it minus 164 or is it positive 300? If, it, if it's minus 164, we're going to slow a lot faster. If it's positive 300, we're going to slow a lot smoother. And that process, the smoother path is likely one that doesn't uh, coincide with a you know a twenty percent decline in the S and P, a twenty five thirty percent decline in the S and P. But the faster path certainly could, in the context 
of the monetary policy tightening we're likely to see next year too. Mm, yeah, I should say on the CAC, CACRI, your, the fear index being so high is actually a bullish yeah. indicator because when everyone's so afraid, they can't get more afraid. Uh, and you actually have a beautiful back test that we can, we can put it on screen that actually when the sphere indicator is high, risk assets actually do perform yeah. well. But again, that's your more sort of short term mm. view. Your medium to longer term view is of this thing of deflation. And I, I'm glad you brought up the economics because um, that, that is the, the, the heart of the issue. Yeah. Uh, the consumer is sitting on $2.6 trillion in excess savings. And you say this can support uh, GDP above yeah. trend. So economic growth will still be high. And yet the, the rate of economic growth will still be slowing down. Uh, and of course, you say the, the, the dispersion that we'll see in asset markets depends on how drastic growth is slowing. Obviously, no one has a crystal ball, but you know, Darius, you are doing these back tests. You are going through the, through the data. What do you see in terms of the probabilistic range for how quickly growth will slow? Because it seems like everything we're talking about here, everything people are listening to, it all hinges on that. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So you know, right now, our models are pointing to a, a moderate growth slowdown that might be a little bit um, more than what consensus is projecting. So that's not in and of itself kind of this negative uh, dynamic. The issue goes back to what the hell is consensus expecting? Right now, again, I mentioned consensus is expecting 3.9% real GDP growth in the calendar year 2022. That's about 170 basis points higher. That's almost double the pace of where we tend to grow uh, from a trend perspective, if you look at the trend, the five-year trend from 2015 on through 2019. And so, you know, the U.S. economy is a two and a quarter percent economy. And so what is causing us to grow nearly double that in the next calendar year? in the context of a, what could potentially be a record fiscal drag and obviously um, you know, pretty, uh, pretty steady monetary policy tightening, uh, which albeit works in a lag. And so clearly investor, could, the economist consensus on Wall Street, global Wall Street, is betting on that consumer, that excess savings from a consumer balance sheet perspective, really kind of um, um, you know, upholding growth in, and kind of you know, uh, sort of making that slowdown process, that normalization process, much more smooth ride. It could be a much more turbulent ride if consumers are unwilling to spend because of inflation. It could be a much more turbulent ride if that income, that excess savings, is unevenly distributed and sort of held at, uh, by people, by, by households uh, that have a lower marginal propensity to consume because they're more wealthy. They don't need to spend this money. Um, they've already gone on a bunch of vacations throughout the pandemic. It's not like they're waiting to go to Disneyland. They've already been to Tulum. Right. Um, and so, like, and so, that, that, and so that, that's, that's sort of the issue as it relates to the growth dynamics, because the market is implicitly expecting things to slow at a very modest pace. If we don't, if we normalize at a more than modest pace, that is where the market risk lies. So if you think you're asking me a question about what my crystal ball expects, it's not even necessarily what the crystal ball expects. It's how do I want to be positioned in the context of the balance of risk? And the balance of risks are most assuredly skewed to the downside with respect to growth, irrespective of what our forecasts say. Darius, you, you, know, you I, would, I would say, have been a, uh, you know, f a full bull throughout this pandemic uh, when a lot of people were bearish. But it seems like you're getting a little bit bearish, if I can use that, that term. Uh, how bearish are you, are you getting? <laughs> well, I'm just, hold on, I'm typing this in my, uh, my handy calculator, my, my iPhone calculator. <laughs> So I just said the stock market could go up 11 percent over the next couple of months. So that's not very bearish, um, but it could go yeah. it could go down 30 percent from there um, just based on the, the normalization process and growth. And so that to me, um, it's about managing risk across multiple durations. And actually, let me take a step back. I think that's kind of the that's a that's a mistake. I think a lot of retail investors make to begin with is having a singular view, um, a bullish or bearish view and having that one view sort of be expressed throughout the entire portfolio, throughout the entire, um, you know, sort of a set of exposures that represent their portfolio. That's the wrong way to manage risk. If you hear one thing in this discussion, stop doing that. This is the appropriate way to manage. I'm not saying we figured it out, but this is how professional money managers do this, both at the highest levels in terms of institutional finance, but also at the family office level, at the RA level, things of this. And so how they manage risk is about thinking about it from a multiple duration perspective, i.e., here are some things that I'm long that I think are likely to outperform over the short term. Here are some things that I th I'm long that might outperform over the, the, the medium to long term that I think I can get a good price now for those types of things. So that's number one. Number two is manage risk from a probabilistic perspective according to different themes. The way we manage themes is through the lens of that grip regime process. Goldilocks, reflation, 
inflation, deflation. At any given time, there's a probability associated with realizing that economically. Like right now, the, the highest probability regime we're likely to realize economically, you know, kind of in the month of January is inflation. But it's not a slam dunk all the way in deflation or is our in inflation, stagflation, as, as most of you would call it. Um, it's not a slam dunk. But, the, you know, the reality is those probabilities evolve over time, both as a function of, you know, moving forward in time and, and having the data change, but also the changes in the data, the changes in how policy is likely impacting, you know, consumer and business activity in, the, in real time. And so the, the key takeaway is that, hey, look, slice and dice your portfolio according to the probabilities associated with the themes that you're invested in but also the probability, the sort of the, the time count, the calendar associated with, you know, kind of what's likely to be realized in the near term versus what's likely to materialize in the medium to long term. But, but looking at your, your forecast for the regimes, the regimes for Goldilocks and reflation are quite probably low, always. not zero, but quite yeah, low. Right. So it sounds like you think the odds of commodities continuing to outperform over the near term is uh, small. Very low, exactly. Very low, Absolutely. yeah. No, you're, you're spot on. That is exactly that's exactly the point. And so, again, it sounds bearish if you think about, you know, kind of having spent most of the past two years being a raging bull, um, you know, kind of on on those types of exposures. But that doesn't necessarily mean you got to run out and sell everything, raise 100 percent cash and, and go go into a bunker. I think that's kind of, you know, that that's that's something I see on finance Twitter a lot. Well, I'm, I'm short in the stock market or, you know, I, I want the stock market to go down margin debt. this, you know, so much bear porn out there that, you know, you can really suffocate, you know, kind of consuming that stuff. And not make any money. And the whole goal of what we're trying to do is help professional and retail investors make money. Um, and the reality is you, 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 being bullish or bearish doesn't help you make money. What helps you make money is being positioned in the right exposures. And so that, that is the key takeaway from the process. And so you know, we're going to be adults about this and saying, hey, look, we've been in this reflationary environment for a really long period of time. We're transitioning to an environment that's quite, po quite simply the polar opposite of a reflation. It may not be the same style of polar opposite. You may not get a record monetary contraction in the same way that we got a record monetary easing throughout that. You may not get a record fiscal contraction, although I think we are getting uh, on the path to getting a record fiscal contraction in the same way that we got a record fiscal easing throughout that process. And ultimately, we may not see, you know, kind of the reverse of that reopening impulse that we saw in the spring of this in 2021. Um, kind of, we don't, we're not going to see another, you know, kind of closed down. You're not going to get that uh, Ricardian effect to the opposite. So, um, you know, it's not going to be the exact opposite in terms of the deflation that we are projecting. Again, deflation means growth and inflation are slowing simultaneously. It's not going to be the polar opposite, but it's going to be opposite enough to cause a lot of investors pain who don't understand, who have not gotten that memo yet. So if someone came to you and they said, Darius, I am foaming at the mouth bullish on copper. My, my, tw my handle on Twitter is at copper bull, I just can't get enough. I want to get as much, much copper as I can get my hands on. You would say, okay, that's your long term view, mm -hmm. and that's fine. You could be right, you could be wrong. I don't know. I don't really have a view on that. But I have a long term over view. The near term, probably going to double in price. Fair, but over the near term, over the next twelve months, the risk you reward, get cut in half in price. Yeah, the risk reward is is bad. It may be time you say, hey, maybe time to trim that copper exposure. And would you like a Coca Cola? Yeah, no, that is exactly. <laughs> You, Jack, I, I love interviewing with you because you find a way to simplify the complex in a way that I, I, I continue to struggle to do. You're absolutely right. Let's talk to our friend uh, at Copper Bull on Twitter here. At Copper Bull could be very right. And quite frankly, I, I tend to agree with the secular inflation case. In fact, I think we've done more work on, on sort of what the drivers of inflation are than anybody. I mean, I've talked to obviously the world's largest institutions and, and you know their eyes pop open when I show them this analysis. And the reality is that our, our, our math on inflation suggests the stationary mean of inflation in the U.S. you know, has transposed itself somewhere between 60 to 100 basis points higher. That means our oscillations from an inflation perspective, headline CPI, core PC, all those things are going to oscillate 60 to 100 basis points higher. Well, that's a big deal if you think about the Federal Reserve who's failed to meet their inflation objective over the last decade, having to now deal with a persistently above trend inflation um, kind of outcome over the next decade over this kind of a decade here we call the 2020s. And so that's a big deal in terms of the monetary policy reaction function that may no longer exist. You know, the same kind of Fed put that we've all become accustomed to that's really carried asset markets, you know, from the 2009 lows to these very lofty uh, levels and valuations. Maybe that's going away at the margins. And so we have, discuss I have discussions with uh, professional money managers on that, that kind of stuff. So I agree with at Copper Bull that the price of copper is likely to go way higher over the long term. But that doesn't mean it can't go down by 33 to 50 percent over the intermediate term. And the name of the game in an asset management is 
Don't be long stuff that's going down a lot and be long stuff that's going up a lot. Now, obviously, it's impossible to do that with every exposure in your portfolio. You'd have to be Bernie Madoff to consistently do that all the time. But the whole goal is to try. And we're using data and we're using sort of a rigorous quantitative process to help ourselves try to get, put ourselves in the best position to accomplish that goal. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so that's c copper. Uh, oh, just I have a question, which is, you said the risk of copper is like a 30 to 50% drawdown. No, no, sorry. Do let me, you, let me, you, I, don't, I don't want to be, don't put me on record saying that. I'm saying if, it, yeah, yeah. if, if there is a risk to a lot of exposures like copper, uh, maybe not copper specifically, but lumber would obviously be a higher beta thing that could easily go down 30, 33 to 50%. You know, those types of exposures, that kind of one way inflation narrative bet that a lot of investors have made and are ultimately going to be proven right on, not only have they already been proven right since the lows of 2020, we think, I think they're going to be proven right over the long term. But that doesn't necessarily mean it can't have a material, sustained, protracted drawdown in the interim, if we're not already, you know, kind of, you know, if that already hasn't begun, I would argue maybe you've already uh, has started, you know. And so that just means like, hey, look, if you're a new market participant or, hey, you just got a new hundred dollars or, you know, just the, the marginal market participant is going to go where there's price momentum. The marginal market participant is generally not inclined to go buy something that's down 33 to 50 percent. Again, I'm not saying copper specifically uh, could be a cryptocurrency or something of like that for, for that matter. And so what we're trying to do, what our entire process is designed to do is to take impulses in the business cycle, understand how those impulses have historically um, you know, really influenced asset market performance, and then use that to front run changes in momentum in securities, Cha front run changes in investor appetite for different pockets of the markets. Yeah. And that it's, it has an aspect of trend falling, which is important for it. So when I first- Trend front run. Yeah, yeah. Trend front run. When, you know, when I first- uh, uh, learned about investing, I thought like, oh, this stock went from $20 to $14. It must be a buy because it's quote worth $20. I and mean, you know, but at, at actual, that, that's a quote contrarian view. Actually on a short-term basis, at least that's a horrible way to go about managing. Like odds are the stock will continue to decline. And you're saying what you intend to do is to do the exact opposite. Not necessarily the exact opposite. It's to use changes in the economy and changes in policy, which are, again, are just a, a derivative of what's happening in the economy to our advantage to identify inflections in the trend. Or, or more importantly, not always identify inflections, but we could also be identifying a continuation of the trend. Like if it's you know January of, of 2021, we're saying, hey, no, we're, we're still on reflation, keep going. Bond yields are gonna keep going higher, you know, all this other stuff. And so that to me is, is important as well to kind of use the process to understand where, where you are in the market cycle. Um, and I have this one really interesting mm -hmm. chart uh, which shows uh, the OECD composite leading index time series for the world. So basically, where's what's global growth? Um, and it shows uh, uh, that chart, that time series relative to the S&P 500 high beta to low beta ratio. Those are the high beta stocks relative to the low beta stocks. And then the red line in that chart shows Bitcoin relative to treasury bonds. And every single time global growth peaks, you see a 50 plus percent decline in high beta stocks relative to the low beta counterparts. And you see a 75 percent plus decline in the price of Bitcoin relative to the price of treasury bonds every single time. And so why is this time any different? If anything, this time could actually be worse if you think about the outsized move we've been on in high beta stocks relative to low beta stocks and Bitcoin relative to treasury bonds. And I use Bitcoin as a proxy for crypto and other high beta uh, types of asset classes. Yeah. Uh, how would you explain Bitcoin's macro portfolio? You know, early on in the days, what happened in the stock market, what happened in the economy didn't necessarily affect the price of Bitcoin. But now it seems increasingly the case that that it does. Uh, what what uh, would you say Bitcoin is a risk asset? Is a is it a hedge against risk? How do you sort of think See, about? I, it? I would I would go back and 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 dis I would respectfully disagree with what you just said. You said early on in the days of Bitcoin, it didn't really have anything to do with that. And I, I would agree early on from I don't know what's called two thousand nine, two thousand twelve. You know, sort of in the halving cycle of twenty thirteen, when a lot of investors, you know, some of the bigger institutional macro fund type managers, you know, Paul Tudor Jones of the world really got involved in the asset class, it started to correlate positively with other risk assets. Not by a lot, but to a, to a, a reasonable enough degree that the analysis that I, that I just cited um, works. And so that first major drawdown in Bitcoin prices relative to treasury bond prices you know, came kind of in this 2014, 2015 time period. That's a long time ago. Um, the second one came obviously in 2018, 2019. I think the third, well, the third one was in the early part of 2020. Um, and so you know, you know, we could potentially be on our fourth one of those uh, market cycles as well. 
uh, heading into, you know, kind of middle 2022. So this is something we want investors to be aware of. That doesn't necessarily mean like the world is over and, you know, sort of everyone who's, you know, made a ton of money in crypto is, you know, going away. And, you know, it's not this sort of draconian outcome. It's just to say that, hey, look, the price of this thing went up a lot. And even if it goes down 85 percent, it's probably still going to be at a higher price than it was before the bull run started. It just means that if you're a new participant in this market, you're going to materially have a big problem for a long period of time if you buy the top of this chart. And so what we're trying to do is to help investors who've been long book gains and also help investors who are new participants not buy the top of the chart and give themselves a better opportunity to make money by, by being more patient. I just want to make this really clear for our audience because to some people, it, it might be like, you know, we're, we're aliens. You're, you're saying that Bitcoin is a macro asset and that in the same way that the price of bonds reacts is, reacts to changes in the price of uh, the growth, inflation and the economy, Bitcoin is, is similar. It, it does the same thing. Yeah, the, absolutely. Do, do the people who invest in Bitcoin go to work and get paid in you know dollars or whatever currency they get paid in? The answer is obviously yes. Um, do the people who are long Bitcoin or other assets or cryptocurrencies, do, are they long other assets like stocks and, and bonds and other assets? The, the answer is usually yes there as well. Um, do the people who are long cryptocurrencies have, you know, sort of um, more uh, margin debt requirements um, in their brokerage account? Or do they have other debt requirements in terms of their mortgage on their homes or their businesses? Yes, the answer is yes to all those things. And so the things, the impulses in the macro economy that would influence their decision making in other asset classes are increasingly likely to influence their decision making in cryptocurrency as well. And especially considering the fact that it is the most high beta, the highest convexity exposure in that, in that um, kind of pocket of their portfolio. Things are phenomenal. Convexity is excellent when the price is appreciating. Convexity sucks yeah. when price is going down. And so I think those same types of rational actors are going to, at, at some point in the next calendar year, are going to see a lot of big declines in prices. If we're not already, again, Bitcoin, has, where was Bitcoin now? Rolls its all time highs, down probably 20% already. What if we're already part of that process? I don't think we're part of the process yet. I think we could very easily make a new high in cryptocurrency in the first quarter of, of 2022. But that is, again, that's probably it. And that could be it for multiple years. And so the risk that investors are faced with, you know, for that asset class, this increasingly correlated asset class to other asset classes, because, again, the people who are the incremental people who are buying it are incrementally more attached to the rest of the real world. And so the, that's the issue. And they could be they could buy a high that is, you know, the pri high of the price chart for multiple years. That sucks. <laughs> you don't want to do that. Yeah. And it, it could be that that short term scenario, as you say, plays out exactly. And yet in 2040, people who have done that, who held were very happy because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that was just a blip on the chart, you know, and they, they made a lot of money. But you're saying in terms of risk management, this is something that people should be aware of. I want to say crypto, it seems to me to be very high beta because beta is just a beta, something that has a beta of two will go up 2% if the stock market goes up 1%. And one is like a beta of like five or six. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but I mean, look, you said something I thought caught my attention. I think it's very important to repeat. You said something like if, if whatever we're talking about right now will be a blip on any chart we're talking about in the year 2040. I mean, that's, you know, 19, 20 or 18 years from now. The issue is none of us would have a job if we're talking about 2040. You know, because if we all had the staying power to just buy the things that we know are going to go up over a long period of time, then all this analysis that we're doing to manage, you know, short to medium term market cycle and economic cycle risk, business cycle risk is irrelevant. It's moot. But the reality is we're all human beings. We're all subject to the same behavioral and cognitive biases that cause us to make a lot more decisions than we probably should as investors. And so my job as a macro risk manager for, you know, the world's biggest and most elite institutions all the way down to someone's, you know, kind of nearing retirement or in retirement is my job is to help those, whatever decisions they're, they're prone to make as behavioral, as, you know, as, as suffering from their own behavioral biases, I suffer from my, from my own. Let's make them be good decisions, right? You know, we're not going to prevent ourselves from being human and interacting with asset markets more than we probably should, more than is actually healthy. But the reality is you can either be making a bunch of dumb decisions or you can make a bunch of good decisions along the way to compound returns and, and generate uh, positive excess returns. So that's what we're trying to do. And, and hopefully uh, we, we're doing a good job. We are doing a good job of that. I, I would agree that you are. Uh, Darius, I meant to have when I said, I'm very glad you're here. I think your analysis at 42 Macro is top notch. Um, and yeah, also, I, I just want to say, Darius, that, that uh, you know, I'm familiar with the, the macro research business a little bit. I re read some reports and 
your reports, not only are they of the highest quality in my view, in terms of rigor, but I also just from, you know, look at it, like you're, they're, they're, uh, nowhere near as expensive as some other services. Um, Our number one goal is to democratize world-class macro risk management process, man. And I don't think you can democratize something truly if it's unaffordable to the average person. You know, I want someone who's managing a $2,000 cryptocurrency account to be able to afford the same research that, you know, Citadel and Point72 is paying for. You know, these are the world's largest, you know, kind of um, hedge funds that, you know, have a big uh, impact on, you know, kind of asset market performance. And so, you know, it's not about, you know, I could sit here and go work at one of those places and get exorbitantly rich, but I don't think that's my, my calling in this world. My calling in this world is to help people understand, get educated about the business cycle and how it impacts asset market performance, get educated about, you know, behavioral and cognitive biases that impact their own investment decision making and, and ultimately safeguard against those, those mistakes um, and reduce the frequency and the severity of those mistakes. Uh, and I, yeah, I'd also say just on the point of the behavior, it's a behavioral point because let's say the long uh, crypto case in 2040 is that's true. If you hold a crypto, buy crypto now until and 2040, you'll be good. Uh, let's say it's, let's say that's true. The person who buys crypto now and holds it till 2040 will be fine and buys buy some of the dip. That that'll be great too. But the, a lot of people you know, have a lot of exposure. And then when something goes down, they panic as a lot of people did during March 20th. Like how many people bought puts on the March 23rd, like the 2020, the day of the lowest day in the S and P 500, you know? So if you're someone who has the sort of, uh, 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 fortitude and the, the foresight to be like, Oh, 80%, nothing. I'm buying more then you can, you know, afford to sort of get risks up. But if you're not, then this risk report is extremely important. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, again, it's, it's about, what is your objective? If your objective is to compound returns and not suffer drawdowns, because the, I think you brought up a great point. When people suffer drawdowns in their portfolio or they suffer drawdowns in a particular security, they, they go on tilt. It's just like being down in poker and, and suffering a bad beat in poker. You start to make decisions that are based on what you want to have happen as opposed to the highest probability decision at any given interval. And that is a bad, that's a no-no. That's a no-no in the asset markets. That's when the market starts taking more of your money from you and then giving it to people who are not making those mistakes. And that's the same thing that happens at the poker table as well. I, I fancy myself a pretty skilled poker player as well. I've, I've been on the, I've been on good side of bad beats. I've been on bad sides of bad beats. And, and, and you know, every time I've been on a bad side of that beat, you know, I tend to, I, I force myself to get up and walk away from the table. Because if you keep playing more hands, yeah. you're going to start to do dumber and dumber things. Um, and that's exactly what happens in asset markets, too. So, you know, somebody had to sell. Everyone tells you they bought the lows in March 2022. I haven't had anybody tell me they sold the lows. But guess what? The entire U.S. equity and global equity markets went down. The entire cryptocurrency market went down. All commodities went down. Crude oil cleared at a negative $40 price of a barrel. Somebody sold that stuff. Somebody did, because otherwise those prices wouldn't have been realized. And so we all need to be honest with ourselves as investors and understand our limitations when volatility is high understanding our limitations when we suffer drawdowns, we might start to make some mistakes. And so what we're trying to do with this analysis, this forward-looking analysis, is to say, hey, yeah, you're right. Cryptocurrency is a phenomenal asset class from a longer-term perspective. I myself am a permeable in cryptocurrency. I think it's a revolutionary, um, you know, sort of, uh, it's both revolutionary from a society perspective, but it's also revolutionary from a technology perspective. I think the societal benefits are probably just as important. It gives millennials and Gen Z years an opportunity to, to generate wealth in financial markets in a way that we have not been able to, generally speaking, because we've been this sort of undersaved, under uh, underemployed, under you know over leveraged student loan uh, generations. Um, and so I think it's really given us an opportunity to really participate in, and make some money in financial markets. That's really cool, uh, but that doesn't mean it has to go up every single day, every single week, every single month, every single year. There are whole. I mean, just pull up a damn chart of Bitcoin. You know, it has these 80, 90 percent drawdowns and it's underwater for three years at a time. Like, that's fine if you're going to hold it to 2040. But that it's not fine if you're going to be the guy who buys the top of the chart and then you freak out while it's on an un- route to an 80 percent drawdown and sell it down 50 percent because you're, you're concerned about losing all your money as opposed to just 50 percent of your money. Somebody has to make that sale. Otherwise, the price chart never gets yeah. there. Someone who, who needs like a volatility of 30 or less in their portfolio. Yeah, yeah. All human beings, all human beings, uh, not all, not all, but the vast, vast yeah. majority of human beings require volatility of 30 or less. I mean, do you understand what that means in terms of your daily fluctuations? I mean, that's probably somewhere around three to three and a half, three and a half percent daily price swings of your net worth. That's ridiculous. 
yeah. Uh, there are some people, uh, definitely some people watching this channel, Darius, who are who are like, um, yeah, that, Darius, that's me. Wait till those people have kids and a mortgage. <laughs> stuff changes real quick. <laughs> well, stuff changes real quick when you have kids and a mortgage. I guarantee you. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> that's true. Let's let's talk about um, the older version of Bitcoin, gold. <laughs> So crypto, very high beta, as you say, gone up way more than the stock market has gone up. Gold has been, to so many, a huge disappointment, even though Bitcoin is thought of as the, quote, digital gold. If gold hasn't shared in the bull run up, maybe is it safer from the, the bull run down? Does it have, Gold must have a pretty low beta now, right? Gold does have a low beta. Um, it, it has historically had a low beta, really since kind of the, the, the post-crisis era, post-global uh, financial crisis era. That beta has come down a tremendous amount uh, since then. Uh, really, really since 2011, since gold peaked in 2011, that beta has gone to, to, to sub one. Gold has historically been a defensive asset. Uh, gold tends to have its best returns in that deflation regime, in, in regime where growth and inflation are slowing simultaneously. So the sort of um, the general sentiment out there that kind of gold is just this sort of lower beta play on crypto or crypto is just this high beta play on gold, in our opinion, is actually is actually a, a misnomer. It's incorrect. Um, empirically, it's incorrect. It's not. It's a fact that it's incorrect. Um, and so, you know, so the, the, you know, we're not going. We don't argue facts at Forty Two Macro. We take facts for what they are. Um, and, and understanding that, you know, from what it is, we we would be but bullishly positioned on gold, not because it's the anti Bitcoin or it's it's not because we we're, we're not formulating our investment decision making on our views on Bitcoin through our views on Bitcoin. We're formulating our investment views based on the impulses and growth, the impulses and inflation, and the policy impulses that are resulting. Uh, that are a function of those two features. So um, gold in our in terms of our, our process should outperform over the intermediate term um, alongside things like the U.S. dollar, treasury bonds, low beta securities in the equity and credit markets, and maybe your select uh, whatever the whatever is a low beta commodity, but I'm not really sure there is, that such a thing exists. Yeah, well, Darius, I'm actually very excited to hear, uh, have you say that because you know I've, I've interviewed you a lot, and a lot of times you're like, Darius, what about gold? And you're like, Jack, not now. Now's not yeah, the yeah. time. So now that you're saying... Now, finally, is the time for gold. Fascinating, Gary, is that in times of deflation, gold does better than times of inflation. So growth is slowing. Uh, so that's gold as well in that because it's a, it's a hedge to safety, flight to safety, whatever you want to call it. But then wouldn't, wouldn't uh, if it gold is an inflation hedge or inflation beneficiary, as many claim, and as lots of periods of history, not all, but a lot but, uh, you know, uh, 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 support, then wouldn't... The quote inflation wouldn't that grid be better than de deflation? Why is it that you think the deflation no, grid no, is no, better? No, no, no. I, 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 it's not think. I, I understand that you've done. I, I, I take your word for it that it's a fact that that gold has done better in the deflation. Why do you think that so is? No, the gold does really well in absolute terms in both inflation and deflation. So inflation is where you have stagflation, growth slowing, inflation accelerating. Deflation is where you have both growth and defl inflation accel decelerating simultaneously. Gold does very well in both of those regimes. It's just that its excess returns relative to other stuff is actually tends to be amplified in deflation because you have more stuff going down. You know, ah, it, just, it okay. becomes more of a shining beacon of, 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 of safe haven um, in deflation than it is in inflation. But inflation, you definitely want to be long gold as well. And so, you know, to me, I think the big kind of, you know, it, it changed in November, in, in early November. Our models start the price in, um, you know, the, the rising probability of an inflation regime which actually coincided with the transition to inflation in an economic standpoint as well. And that's where you started to see the material underperformance of cryptocurrency relative to, 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 to gold bullion. Um, and that's something that on a medium term perspective, we would expect that to continue. I, again, I do believe that risk assets are, are you know, we're, we're quite pot, we're very constructive on risk assets on the short term perspective, i.e. over the next you know, one, two, maybe even three months. And that's where you could potentially see a recovery in cryptocurrency. You know, maybe Bitcoin makes a new all-time high, Ethereum makes a new all-time high, and leaves gold in the dust. But from that point forward, that to me is where the real game gets difficult, um, and you're you're going to really be at a significant disadvantage as an investor if you think we're still in the same regime that generated the previous all-time highs in cryptocurrency. So you, you think there will be a bump in the road for high beta risk assets? You do, it's probably not a month away. Could be two months, three months, could be five months, but it's in that two to five month yeah, where, where there, there will be a bump. Yeah, I would be, yeah. if, if, they, if my current framework, and again, we'll, we'll talk to you in a few months to, to sort of get the updated view on this, based on everything I know today, and again, everything we know today is informed by some of the world's most sophisticated econometric models. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling quite confident in what we, you know, what I know today. And I, more importantly, I'm confident in that I have the tools 
to change my views along the way, right? It's not about what I think and just to have, you know, plugging my ears, closing my eyes and screaming at the top of my lungs and just maintaining that view, which a lot of investors make the mistake of doing these days because they're wedded to their narratives, they're wedded to their themes. We're not wedded to our themes, we're wedded to our process. And right now our process is saying, hey, look, asset markets should go up. Risk assets, risk appetite, those things should be improving into the beginning of the next year. We are not quite at the place of the cycle where we think markets are going to have a real big tough time with this pace of normalization and growth, with the pace of normalization in monetary and fiscal policy. We think the markets can potentially start to have a tough time with the pace of normalization and growth, with the pace of normalization in monetary and fiscal policy, starting at the earliest late Q1, early Q2. So that, that is when I would expect to see, hey, look, if we've made new highs in cryptocurrency, it's very likely we make new highs in stocks if we haven't already. Um, actually, I think we are today. Uh, you know, it's very likely we make new highs in a lot of you know, high beta risk assets into that process. But from there, the problem with a lot of investors, that a lot of investors are going to make a lot of mistakes in that particular moment, in my opinion, because they're going to see the price chart and they're going to think that the regime that carried them to those, those highs, those new highs, is the same regime that created the previous you know, highs in the price chart. And that is very much not the case economically. That is very much not the case from a policy perspective as well. And from that point forward, you could actually see a tremendous amount of volatility, not just associated with the pace of that normalization process in growth and policy, but it's also associated with the pace of normalization and positioning. Because you're going to have the whole market trying to get out of high beta positioning and into low beta positioning at the same time. And there's just not enough liquidity out there for that process to transpire in a low volatility manner. Mm. Uh, Darius, can, can you quickly talk about how th that your view go impacts value versus growth? Because when I hear high beta, I think of like the ARKK stocks, which are obviously on the growth side of the spectrum. But it's also my understanding, you know, the, the cyclicals are their they're value. So where are you sort of uh, going out and shaking? You know, will it be the expensive stocks that outperform the cheap ones or vice versa? Yeah, so high beta growth uh, is a sale. But low beta growth is a buy. And that's, you know, it's as simple as being short everything Kathy Woods long and, and long Apple. I mean, that's just, I mean, you don't have to make it more complicated than that. Um, you know, the market is really smart at differentiating between business models, the volatility of earnings, the volatility of cash flows, you know, high multiple stocks relative to low multiple stocks. You know, our, 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 our capital markets are here in the U.S. are the most sophisticated in the world. We have the, the, world's, the, the world's smartest investors, not that they're all dumb as hell in the U.S., but we the world's smartest investors all participating because we have the largest and most deep and liquid capital markets in the world. And so the reality is the market's really good at saying, hey, look, I don't want to be long value or high beta growth in that type of scenario. Let me just go buy Apple. You know, let me go buy the iPhone 13 or 14 cycle um, because, you know, it might, it might even be like the most minor change in the phone. I mean, I can't tell the difference between iPhone 13 and iPhone 12. And I think the difference between 14 and 13 might even be smaller. But guess what? Investors will go buy that cycle because it is a lower beta expression on growth and it's the growth that they can find as opposed to the growth that is disappearing and evaporating. Yeah, well, Darius, I will say if you ever, uh, you know, uh, meet someone who's into it, works in the movie business and film, a producer, and it's like they love the new iPhone. They, the, they, the camera just makes them go wild. It's like you and me would sort of nerd over charts. Like they, they have the same sort of excitement the over 13? the camera. <laughs> Well, I, I, st yeah, I stand yeah, yeah. corrected. Uh, my apologies. <laughs> Let me go get my iPhone. I, I don't. I don't. I haven't taken a picture in probably four years, so I'm kind of the, the <laughs> oldest millennial on earth in that regard. Yeah. Well, sc screenshotting charts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Screenshotting <laughs> charts is the only thing I do. There you go. Um, Darius, earlier you mentioned narratives. I've heard you talk about how you think there's sort of a bubble in narratives. What what comes to mind? What would example be of a, a narrative that's in a bubble, and how is it? degrading like future investor performance and like increasing risk. Yeah, so I think it increases risk uh, on an ex ante basis. And the reason I say that, you know, the bubble narratives is, to me is, is mostly centered around inflation in this particular uh, genre. Um, it's sort of, you know, all right, the, the Fed has created too much inflation. Fiscal policy has created too much inflation. It's the 1940s. It's the 1960s. It's the 1970s. And I've heard all three derivations of that at every interval for every week for the past kind of 50 something weeks. You know, like, and then, you know, and, and, and maybe that's accurate. And, and I tend to agree that, you know, there are pockets of you know what we observed in the 1940s that are kind of occurring today in terms of financial repression. There are pockets of what we observed in the 1960s that are occurring today in terms of the labor market and, and what's happening uh, from, a, from a secular perspective in the labor market that might actually be 
um, you know, perpetuating, sowing the seeds of the longer term inflationary wave. And again, our model's already picking up on this, you know, going back to the 60 to 400 basis point transposition in the uh, in stationary mean of inflation. We already know this. But that doesn't mean that you need to go be long, at max long inflation hedges at every interval between now and the end of the decade. And that to me is the big market risk, is that the average investor has convinced themselves, and again, they're probably right, and again, our, our analysis would say they're right, has convinced themselves that being long of inflation hedges is the most appropriate expression of the current macroeconomic regime that we're in, both from a policy perspective, but also from the perspective of the level of growth and inflation. And that was true up until, you know, a few months ago. Um, and the reality is it may be true again for, you know, the next few months in the first quarter of, of 2022. But from our perspective, from the perspective of our models, that will become increasingly less true as we progress throughout the balance of 2022 and into 2023. But that doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean it's not the 1940s or the 1960s. It just means the damn positioning is wrong. You know, that the, that, that the market price for the, the people who are paying to exchange this exposure is wrong. You know, the, the markets are cyclical. They go up, they go down. Um, you know, they respond to impulses and people's demands and preferences for liquidity, the, the, the tightness and the, the easiness of credit, um, both in the financial markets and in the broader economy. And they ultimately they respond to impulses and growth and inflation because that determines investor appetite for taking risks or not taking risks in certain types of exposures. And so, you know, what I mean by going back to kind of your, your original question, the bubble in narratives is the bubble in positioning associated with those narratives. People have never been more confident, certainly in my career, I've been doing this since 2009, since the middle of 2009, they've not been more confident in, in, in being ardent and steadfast in remaining long of inflation hedges. And in our opinion, according to our models, at some point, it's probably around the second quarter of next year, that's going to start to become a very, very challenged position, challenged thesis, according to the market. The market is likely to apply some pain and pressure into those positioning to give other opportunities, to give the investors other opportunities to get in. Maybe copper is on its way to $600 an ounce, or whatever copper is uh, quoted in. Copper is quoted in probably ounces, if I have to guess. Uh, you know, maybe it's on its way to 600 over the next few years. But it doesn't mean it can't go to 350 from 443 first. And that, to me, is a big market risk associated with the bubble in narratives. Because people, when they hear a narrative, and again, Daniel Kahneman, Amos Tversky, um, uh, Cass Sunderland, they've done a tremendous amount of behavior economics work in this regard. People see that path to 600 is linear. It's very much not linear. It could go to 750 to 350 and land at 600. And if you buy at the 750 and sell it at 350, guess what? You just lost half your money. You know what I mean? But the, it's still going from 440 to, to 600. Yeah. But that's a very, you know, the path, it's path. That you, how your returns as an investor are path dependent. They're not dependent on the outcome. They're dependent on the path the markets take to get to the outcome. Yeah, it's, it sounds like the error in, in the narrative of the copper as inflation trade, oil as inflation trade. It sounds like you think that the error is that they're actually not inflationary hedges. Copper and oil are reflationary hedges. Bingo. Oh, my yeah. God, Jack. You're so good at this, man. <laughs> you explain my process better than I do. I learned from you, man. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. They're, they're reflation plays, not inflation plays. Yeah. All right. So, so when I think of copper, then I think of China, which, you know, from 2000 to 2007, just devoured all the copper uh, uh, from the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. China now is slowing down the chart of, you know, Alibaba or MCHI, pick your poison. China, it's, it's a disaster. If you look at the chart, like 40, 50 percent drawdown since the summer. However, looking at your 42 macro grids model in the sea of deflation, the blue D's, uh, it's like a canoe of eyes in China, the red eyes. And you think China could growth inflation or growth uh, is not going to slow down as much as people think maybe? It's going to bottom. It's likely to bottom in March and then start to inflect higher. And so those eyes will transition to ours, those reflation ours. And so China's on a separate economic path than the rest of the world, partially because they've taken their lumps from a policy perspective in 2021. Yeah, you know, we're just now starting to get ourselves in a place where we might start to take lumps. <laughs> if you think about the Fed and you think about U.S. fiscal policy whining about uh, Senator Manchin balking at the Build Back Better agenda and, and obviously Powell kind of accelerating the taper. We're still technically easing, right, <laughs> from a monetary policy perspective in the U.S. We're just now getting ourselves to a place where we're going to start to remove accommodation. And that process will be ongoing, you know, 
pretty much early to mid 2022, all the way through likely, you know, 2023, all the way through whenever growth slows to a place where the Fed actually freaks out again. Um, you know, who knows when that may occur. I think it's late 2022, early 23, 23 at the latest. Or I'm sorry, at the earliest, my apologies. China just did all that. China went on in terms of the Common Prosperity Initiative and the macro prudential tightening that's been associated with that. They've already done that. We've already seen the excess of uh, deleveraging in China um, in terms of its credit impulse. You know, we have not seen that in the U.S. to the same degree. Um, and so, you know, to our, in our opinion, in our model's opinion, China's likely to bottom before everyone else is. And oh, by the way, they have some pretty big um, policy catalysts next year that should sort of perpetuate um, a positive market response to that early bottoming process. You have said the Beijing uh, Winter Olympics, which should coincide right around the bottom in Chinese growth, and we could actually inflect from there. Uh, so that'll be positive. Um, and then you also have the, the Party Congress at the end of next year, you know, where we're going to outline some pretty major initiatives, uh, big plans. You know, obviously, G gets this sort of triple stamp on the core, you know, coronation process in terms of being president for life and elevating himself to a status where, you know, that's only been achieved by Mao and Deng Xiaoping. All that stuff, in our opinion, is likely to catalyze, you know, sort of, you know, inflows back into this asset class. We've seen a lot of inflows, out, outflows from the asset class this year. But one, both as a function of the burning, the, the dumpster fire that was Chinese economic activity and Chinese asset markets this year, but also in the context of, hey, look, everywhere else is it's positive. It's reflation. Why the hell am I losing money in China when I can just go buy uh, the U.S. equivalent? You know, and so I think that that process at the margin should reverse in a material way throughout the balance of next year. So uh, we're, we're very bullish on China. Thank you. Uh, Darius, how, what's your outlook on emerging markets and the dollar? I think I have an inkling given your deflation inflation view, but could you just flesh, flesh out your view? Yeah, I, 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 everything I just said about China is not necessarily something that I could share across broader emerging markets. Um, broader emerging markets are, you know, to a large degree on the same policy tightening path that we are on. Um, if you look at, you know, places like uh, Brazil and, and kind of the Latin America, a lot of Eastern Europe, they're already on a a monetary policy tightening course. And so it's unlikely we'll see an amelioration of that, that, that policy tightening anytime soon. Um, and also it's very likely that, you know, we see, you know, continued strength in the dollar, maybe not as broad as it had been in terms of you might start to see some strength in the Japanese yen and Swiss franc. Uh, but, you know, that as long as the dollar's, you know, generally appreciating against the euro, that tends to be kind of negative for a broader emerging market risk. So um, that's negative from an emerging market perspective. What's positive is that you still have this sort of delayed reaction function in terms of vaccine dissemination and, 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 and you know, antivirals and all this stuff. So EM broadly, you know, is kind of on a lag in terms of their growth potential, in terms of their recovery back to trend growth. Um, and so, you know, I think those dynamics, that's the real big push pull that I don't have a good answer to yet. And if I don't have a good answer to it, that means I don't have a high probability bet to make in a portfolio. So therefore, I'm not going to make a bet there. So I'm going to I'm going to put my chips where I think there's a higher probability of making money over the short to medium term. Got it. Uh, uh, what about Europe? Uh, no, Europe, Europe is very much tethered to this sort of U.S. economic cycle. They're very much in line with where we are. In fact, you know, one thing we haven't talked about and, uh, you know, kind of got this um, uh, nugget from my buddy uh, Alfonso Pecatiello over at uh, Macro Compass. You know, oh, he yeah. was saying, hey, look, if you look at the ECB's guidance on, on their, their, their PEP program and all the, and the balance sheet um, um, and, and the TL, TLRTO program, we actually might see quantitative tightening in, in Europe next year. You know, like like so they're already slowing normalizing from a growth perspective. And we talked about that delta in terms of consensus expectations uh, in the U.S. economy. You know, we're 3.9 percent GDP expected by economists for next year, where the reality is we're two and a quarter economy from a potential GDP perspective. So something's got to fill that delta. That void is way bigger in Europe. You know, so Europe's they're expecting, um, you know, just a, just, um, you know, 3.9, 3.8 GDP as well. But the, the, the delta between uh, that expectation and the you know trend growth rate in Europe is even it's almost double. You know, Europe's a one percent economy, one one point one percent potential GDP economy. So how in the heck is Europe going to grow four percent next year? What is with balance sheet contraction out of the ECB? I don't know. With you know no more fiscal bazooka coming. You know to me I just I that excess saving dynamic better materialize next year because again we know the excess savings exist. It's just that are they all going to be consumed? in 2022 to support those growth expectations. And if they're not all consumed in 2022, that path to normalization from a growth perspective in both the US and European economies, and really is a function of those two economies, really the broader global economy, is going to be much faster than the asset markets are currently positioned for. And that's a problem. 
Mm, brilliant. Well, Darius, thank you so much. Been great to hear your perspective. I really uh, urge people um, to, to follow Darius on Twitter. You can be found at at 42 macro, capital D, capital D, A L E. And also, uh, Darius, I understand your alias um, at Copper Bull. People can find your, your thoughts on Copper, <laughs> Copper there. No, no, absolutely. But uh, you know, one thing we'll, uh, I will we'll call out um, everything we talked about. We write about every day at, at 42 Macro. We publish a, a weekly video in terms of helping investors risk manage this from a portfolio construction perspective. And every month, we do a deep dive presentation on where all this information is being sourced from. And so, you know, to the extent that you guys, you know, have 50 bucks, so have 180 bucks a month to come check us out, we certainly think it's more, more than well worth the investment um, in terms of, you know, ha- actually taking everything I just said and putting it to you in a very consumable format that, you know, with very specific. Um, exposures and weightings uh, from a portfolio construction perspective, that tends to be a very popular product that we, we, we send out for our subscribers. Cost of three, you know, Grubhub orders, you could protect your, your family's nest, net worth. You can protect your portfolio. To me, I think it's, it's a no-brainer, but, you know, you know, teach their own. <laughs> Grubhub sounds pretty high beta to me. Like, sure. <laughs> All right, well, Darius, thanks so much. And yeah, I would love to, uh, to have you back yeah. soon. All right, man, I appreciate you, Jack. Thank you so much for having me. 